sorry about the toasty conditions in here. This building is so old, it can't get it straight. When it's warm outside, it should be cooler inside and vice versa. So tomorrow when it snows, if you stop by, it will be 20 <laughs> degrees in here. So. But I apologize. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Tara Stratton. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here at the Dramatists Guild. And it's my great privilege to put together these events for you. We try to do two a month for the fall and spring semester. On the back of your program, you'll see the next two events. Unfortunately, Tuesdays is full, but please feel free to watch it online, and we'll send you that link tomorrow. But there is still space available for the Monday, December 8th event on tax information for artists, which is going to be very interesting. We will have two playwrights on the panel who've actually been audited by the IRS and have been going through protracted uh, negotiations oh, no. over the whole hobbyist thing. So that will be something I think that you will um, take a look at. If you have ideas for other seminars, please feel free to email me here at the Guild or call me. Let me know what you're interested in seeing. If you could please put your phones on vibrate. You don't need to turn them off. We'd be happy if you tweeted throughout the event or posted on Facebook or you know sent texts to your friends. Hey, please watch this great event right now. <laughs> uh, if you're watching online, hi, welcome. If you'd like to tweet questions, uh, please send them to at Dramatist Guild, hashtag new play. And uh, starting tomorrow or maybe next week, since it's a holiday week, you'll be able to watch the entire archived version of this event on the Guild's YouTube channel. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce an old friend who I'm so happy to see again, Sylvan Oswald. Um, I actually feel like I need to take a quick poll because um, when Terry uh, asked me to do this, it was in the framework of a series of, it came out of this idea that um, there needs to be more dialogue around representing people um, other than outside of your own experience. How many people here are here tonight because they uh, haven't yet and yet plan to try to represent LGBT characters in their work? Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, good. So, but that's so that's interesting to see that we're in a there's lots of different I'm I would love to actually ask everyone all the reasons <laughs> for being here, but I should probably conduct the panel first. But anyway, thank you to the Dramatist Guild for um, setting this up and holding this important series of talks. Um, and thank you to you guys for being here and being so awesome and I can't wait to get into it with you. And Terry Stratton, thank you for um, setting this up. So our charge tonight as a panel and as a room full of people is to get beyond um, the stereotypes of angry lesbian and gay best friend or any of the other stereotypes that you can think of um, that come up when we talk about gay and queer representation. Um, in the, 20, in, in the 21st century. So we're, we are the inheritors of a substantial body of work by writers who came before us, um, who braved the struggles of getting meaningful LGBT representation on stage in the first place. But since we are playwrights and not historians, I'm gonna try to relieve us of the burden of having to like know everything um, and also to kind of answer for everybody who came before. So I'm gonna try to frame this uh, in relation to ourselves and our own work and and hopefully by hearing some of what um, we've all, the kind of deals we've made with ourselves and the world to make our work that might prove inspirational or informative to you guys slash the internet. Uh, so before we start I actually want to do something that's kind of uh, in so somewhat educational, <laughs> um, which is that, you know, what I'm here representing the T and the LGBT tonight. <laughs> and as and because of that, I just wanted to have a moment where we um, introduce ourselves briefly and um, our preferred gender pronouns. So uh, uh, my name is Sylvan and my preferred gender pronouns are he, his and him. My name is Christina Anderson and my preferred gender pronoun is she, her. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm Madeline George. I also use she. Uh, I'm David Grimm, and I usually answer to he, but I have been known to answer to she. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Um, so there might be some vocabulary that we throw around, but I'm assuming a lot of people will be uh, familiar with things. I, let's just make a deal that if there is vocabulary that comes up that you guys don't know, you can just, we'll, we'll take questions at the end, but maybe raise your hand in the middle, and we'll, um, check in on vocabulary if anything comes up that people are unfamiliar with. Um, 
So we are prepared for the un uninitiated as well as the initiated here. So let's just get started with where we're coming from on all of this. How did you guys, um, did you, when you first started writing plays, were you writing about gender and sexuality from the get-go? The oldest one on the table. <laughs> um, I think, yes. Yes, I was. Um, I don't know that it was necessarily, uh, I think my work, I came out uh, when I was 15, um, and I started writing plays, I guess, when I was 13. So uh, there wasn't a lot of lag time between uh, writing, when I started writing plays and when I accepted and came out with my sexuality. Um, it, uh, in the same way that people often sort of hedge and don't answer questions directly, or at least for me, you know, a lot of things like, do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? And I'd say, yeah, I'm seeing someone, they, and use all those vague pronouns. So my plays also had that sort of vagueness and wouldn't, wouldn't really stake its claim. But then once I did, uh, my work did. Um, and so I think my development as a human being and my development as my work sort of pretty much mirrored each other in their openness, I suppose. What about you? Well, I mean, you know, I was a young playwright, you know, the Young Playwrights Festival, which happens in, in, here in New York City. So when I was 17 and 18, I had short plays done off Broadway. And one of them was uh, a sort of mm, kind of a choreo poem manque about these four <laughs> women in the waiting room of a liposuction clinic. And I thought it was about four straight women in a liposuction clinic. And then I found a review of it in a zine. And um, the reviewer was like, describe this little play, and then said at the end, obviously Madeline George has no idea that she's a lesbian, but someday <gasps> soon will enjoy the fruits <laughs> of this movie. And I was just like, oh, this is horrifying. You know, rip, rip. Um, cut to a few years later when I was writing you know, plays about lesbians. So but were you, were you out when that came? No, no. I, that is so no. not OK. No, it wasn't. So you were it outed. Little, you were outed. I guess. I mean, I, ha I don't know how to explain it, but I, I had a boyfriend who, whom I loved very much, but I looked exactly like I look now. So I feel like many <laughs> people often would say, you know, things, make assumptions about me, and then I would be like uh, indignant. Um, you know, like there's a lot of ways to be a straight person, you know, like including being a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> it's a broad spectrum. Uh, let me see. I also uh, sort of dabbled in the Creole poem uh, territory. And I was also a young playwright, as the other two panelists said, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So we got four young playwrights up here. Um, you were too. Uh, no. Oh. no. But you were, in age, you were a young playwright. Yes, but yes. I wasn't a young uh, playwright. Yeah. Um, okay. In quotes. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, when I first started, uh, or when I first got introduced to theater, I will say that uh, there's a children's theater in Kansas City, Missouri called The Coterie. And uh, one of the earliest plays that I remember going to see was My Children, My Africa. And uh, it has a male <coughs> protagonist uh, who's African. And all of my friends, we were all like, oh, you know, he's so cute. And the curtain call came, and we were all like, oh, he's so cute. I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. And I found out a year later that it was actually a girl who played that part. Um, and that. Uh, <laughs> sort of transformed a lot of things for me. At the time, I didn't know it, but in hindsight, it was just like, oh, okay, so this is how gender can work on stage, this is how casting can work on stage, how did the play change, um, depending on who plays a part, who plays a role. Um, and I, I was also reading a lot of like black women's literature, so Ntozaki was big in my life, uh, Terry McMillan novels were big in my life, so there were a lot of like black women gender issues going on. Um, unfortunately, mm. with a lot of Terry McMillan's early novels, even though they were fantastic, they always had the the, um, the lecherous lesbian who would wait until her girlfriend <laughs> or like her straight girlfriend got drunk and would try to climb on top of her. Um, Is so that like, offensive? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's a tactic. I'm not, you know. Uh, but in terms of like literary tropes, you know, it had been exhausted in a lot of that literature. Um, so it wasn't really until college, uh, you know, when I studied with Elmo Terry Morgan at Brown, um, and he introduced us to, uh, you know, because at the time I didn't know um, Lorraine Hansberry was queer, um, Essex Hemphill, Jewel Gomez, uh, Sharon Bridgeforth. We just started reading a lot of, like, queer black people. Um, and that definitely sort of influenced and really broadened my spectrum of how to uh, look at sexuality and gender and all these other uh, politics and drama. So. 
So I guess it didn't, it, it started early on in a certain shades, but it didn't really start to bloom until college for me. Mm. Yeah. Um, you segued nicely into the next thing, but I want to <laughs> share my experience with this, which is that, and actually what you were saying, I had forgotten about this, my actual first play. I was thinking of, I also had young player, the young playwrights organization in my school, the Philadelphia, uh, there was a Philadelphia uh, entity, but it wasn't like a branch of it. It was like its own thing, but inspired by, and it was quite strong. And they came into my junior high school, and at 13 I wrote a play about a young man uh, coming out as gay, but it was like, you know, it was like, there's like so many levels of inversion going on there, to use a historically potent word. But, um, yeah, so that, I totally forgot about it. And they actually brought in kids from the high school to act it. And it was directed by the, like, high school drama guy because they didn't trust the junior high school students to do it justice. Wow. <laughs> so just that, your play. Yeah, just oh. my play because oh. it had, like, it was, like, you know, hot button oh, hot, topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so actually I was, I did want to talk about like who are the people who, and but maybe this is different than the list of people who ultimately inspired you the right place, but who, were there artists or um, what, what, what did you encounter culturally, maybe playwrights, maybe not, that freed you up to write um, the character, the L, like queer characters? Well, it's anybody. interesting listening to the influences because what, it occurred to me one of the things that was a big turning point for me was when my uh, queer characters, when I made the conscious decision because the, the, the culture and society in which I grew up in, uh, those characters, if represented at all, were tragic or disastrous characters. I mean, they, they usually killed themselves or got killed or you know, got people drunk, were evil. Uh -huh. uh, and when I made the decision that this was not going to be a tragic character, which is also a way of saying, I'm going to look at myself differently. I'm going to look at my own engagement with, because that's, you're engaging with the material, you're engaging with mm -hmm. issues of identity. So when am I going to stop seeing myself as some sort of tragically flawed being? Uh, and because the kind of writing I do, which it basically came down to this, I grew up reading the classics and I loved all these, uh, whether it's novels or, 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 or the plays of Shakespeare, Elizabethan playwrights, and I would read them and, and I, I would feel a great kinship with the, with the use of language and imagery and so forth, but I always felt locked out because of an identity issue. And so I said to myself, okay, so I'm going to write all those plays that belong on that damn shelf that I'm yeah. not included in. Uh, so it's sort of, uh, I've sort of looked at my work in that respect as uh, trying to make change from within the structure, the pre-existing uh, literary structures. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, the, my, my influences were not necessarily, I mean, there were influences of, uh, uh, gay and lesbian writers who who made a great deal of difference to me, but mostly I I, I would go towards the, 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 those writers who it was unheard of, and I would sort of study that and then try to undermine it. Yeah, infiltration. Yeah, exactly. I, I love was a that. spy. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, I. Well, it's funny because my sophomore year at Brown, I had written a play. Um, that was loosely inspired uh, from Lorraine Hansberry's life um, and how you know she was this black um, activist during the civil rights movement, but she was also like fairly active in lesbian culture at the time too. So I had written a character of this black woman who was a part of the black arts movement, um, but she also had a white lover and very pro-black militant boyfriend uh, that she was keeping two separate lives. Um, and it, and it was interesting. I learned a lot about playwriting from that structure, just like traditional structure. Uh, but after writing that play, I made this decision that I would never have the, the gossipy crew uh, ever again in any of my plays. So like, you know, those group of people would be like, did you see so-and-so at the da-da-da-da? Ooh, I think he's funny, you know? I ban those people from my play <laughs> worlds. I don't include them in the talk. I don't include any gossip. Um, uh, you know, in, in a lot of, and I just sort of made a decision after that that everyone was included. 
Uh, the only times they weren't included was when they were just a bona fide jerk. But it was a very individual characteristic. It wasn't speaking to the larger, you know, culture or any kind of identity. Um, so, uh, you know, because I do think that there can be queer people who are jerks, you know, oh, yeah. and they are flawed characters uh, uh, in general, regardless of, you know, any kind of identity or a preference or any of those things. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, uh, it's sort of a different kind of infiltration in that, you know, uh, I guess in a weird way, if those plays and decided not to include me, then I wouldn't necessarily make room for them in my work either. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so like, were there artists who, who you were like, when you encountered them, you felt uh, empowered even more to write queer characters? I mean, I was extremely affected by seeing Claire Chafee's Why We Have a Body at the Women's Project in 1993. It was very, that play is very beautiful and worth looking at again if you haven't looked at it in a long time or if you've never heard of it. Um, and it, partly, you know, I think at the time I wasn't so necessarily aware of how influential the um, openness of the um, queer sexuality was on me. I felt it formally influential. Um, and it's it's very it's a, it's rather dreamlike, and it blends sort of um, monologue with scene and moves around in time in an interesting way, and I really kind of glommed onto those things, and I think probably it was actually a fusion of the kind of electricity of that er erotic charge in the story plus the I mean this was true for me with Paula Vogel's work as well, um, but what I, what I was thinking at the time was that the formal um, innovations of that playwriting were what was so attractive to me about it. And I think it was that plus this sort of other sensibility. But it's not like I was looking at, you know, Ionesco and being like, woo, you know. Um, it was the, there was some blend of the, not that I, no, nothing against Ionesco, nothing against Ionesco. That I, I knew I wouldn't have as, uh, anything articulate to say as you guys. <laughs> you should have just gone. No, very Are you kidding me? No, it's great. I mean, and f on, for me it was, um, I don't really know how I started to imagine myself. Like the, before I came out as trans, I it took my plays always knew more about my burgeoning gender and sexuality than I did. So there were always like these plays kind of going before me out into the world that were kind of displaying something that I didn't know how to explain. And so I would I started writing these roles for women to play men or boys. Um, and it was uh, later on. Someone was like, "This is a pants roll," like referencing the the device in opera. But I didn't know what that was. Like somehow, I started to kind of allow myself to imagine that for myself. And you know, as as you were saying, as a reflection of myself. And but it took me a really long time to under to know what I was doing. And in fact, it wasn't until I was in graduate school and had a fight with my mentor who was like, "What the hell is this?" You know, that I was like, I don't know, you know, and my mentor was like, you know, this can't be a pants roll because the, the um, convention is that it gets revealed. And I was like, well, it just doesn't, okay? I don't know, leave me alone. And, you know, and I think that that was way, way, way before I knew that I was trans. And I think that's what I was trying to represent without knowing it. Um, and what actually freed me to start to write those things more intentionally was, um, seeing performances by Split Bridges and Five Lesbian Brothers and like run and actually meeting actors. Like one time I wrote Dominique DeBell of the Five Lesbian Brothers like an, a letter to address to New York Theatre Workshop during the run of um, Oedipus at Palm Springs because I saw her performing and I was like, oh my God, that there's the like butch grown up actor that I've been lo looking for. Partly it was a matter of casting. Like there's simple, I mean, we can get into the casting issue, yeah. right, at some point, but you know, there frankly were not the actors for me to be writing for. So I actually thought that it wasn't even a possibility that these real, I was actually trying to, I kept doing what I would call like school for butches. So like every time I would try to have these plays and uh, you know, I would have to like train some <coughs> poor straight g cis girl uh, how to do it. Or, or maybe it was a, a queer cis girl. M the cis meaning someone who doesn't identify as trans, whose um, ex the gender that they were assigned at birth lines up with the one that they experienced themselves to be. And um, so I would constantly be having to like train them on like how to walk and like what to wear. And I was like, please don't have a ponytail and like all kinds of things like that. Um, and then seeing those actors, I was finally like, oh my God, 
this is possible. And then I ran into, I saw Becca Blackwell performing, who's like one of my muses, performing in Circus of Muck in Union Square in Lord knows what year, 15 years ago or something. And I, and I was like, oh, and I like went over to them and, and like climbed over the fence and I was like, who are you? <laughs> Like, I, I have to know who you are, because I, I have to. And it was, weirdly, it was like kind of tracking, finding the people. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, I can do this. Um, and seeing Peggy Sean, things like that. But it's so fantastic, too, that you like sought everybody out, you know? And it wasn't just sort of like this faraway admiration that you were like, hey, come here. I want to do these things and make this community and make this art. So that's pretty cool. I mean, I think it was life or death. Like, yeah. I don't think that I could have continued. Yeah. There was no way to continue, because it just couldn't be. There was, there, you know? I think in the, in the sort of uh, fluidity of sexuality and how writers explore that, I think transgender issues really are, that's the front line of these issues. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I find it tremendously exciting um, because it really makes us confront the fluidity of sexuality and, and that it isn't, you know, this box and this box and that, um, anyway, sorry, continue. No, that's great. I'm actually happy for you to kind of like jump in and stuff. It doesn't have to be me oh, feeding sorry. us conversation <laughs> topics at I all. Just, I was just so caught up in that story of you like writing <laughs> letters. It was so charming. I you wrote it like, on pink paper yeah. too. Cause, and I knew that was, cause I knew that was gonna be like, like a dorky and adorable. Yeah. So I like printed it out on pink pink paper. And but didn't it work? And also, didn't you have yes. Dominique in one of your readings Dominique later? wrote me an email back and was like, I'll be in your reading if you still have it. And but I want to jump on the bandwagon with Becca Blackwell, who uh, read two or three readings of this new play I'm working on and is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, truly a, 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 truly. a great artist. Yeah. I mean, has made my work possible for the last 10 years, you know, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I don't think I could have written most of the plays that I have written recently without knowing that, 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 sh that they were out there to do the role. Yeah, when the reading of my dreams was I had a play where I had, I, my dream was to see a kind of family tree of like transmasculine identity and it was like Peggy Shaw, Becca, and Jess Barbagallo in the one reading and that was like, I was wow. like, die and go to heaven. It was, it was really cool. Um, but yeah, so, so many of these amazing people. Um, it's, it's interesting that there's a mix of both like um, queer influence, but also not queer influence and, and thoughts about like kind of joining a community versus um, kind of infiltrating the canon and trying to kind of reimagine ourselves within it. Um, I think that's, I mean, it's really interesting also because uh, we, as for queer playwrights, we are not people, we're not very rainbow flaggy, the four of us. And we aren't sitting there writing gay, gay, gay plays, right? We're kind of, we're, I mean, all of us are really interested in history um, and also engaged in questions of language. Um, so I just find that, to, that in a way that the, the gay is not always like the leading reason to be writing sometimes. What do you think? I mean, I wrote this play that's called Seven Homeless Mammoths Wander New England, and it's, I mean, it's a play that's sort of ostensibly about marriage. You know, it, it's about the premises that um, a woman of a certain age, her ex-girlfriend, who they were together for many years, has a, uh, a recurrence of cancer and moves back into the house that they shared for a long time, but now there's a new, much younger girlfriend, and the three of them have to live in the house together. Then there's other shenanigans that are happening in the play. It's comedy. Um, and it's ba and it, it derives a lot of its dramaturgy from f the sitcom Friends, which in my opinion is a great um, literary achievement of the 20th century. <laughs> so, and I wrote it, you know, I didn't do it consciously necessarily, but I, um, you know, I think I was in a way, and I feel like this is maybe controversial from a more radical standpoint, but I was interested in unproblematically just taking forms from sitcoms, not, I mean, just forget Moliere, you know what I mean, like, or whatever, just like forms that are, people are yeah. trafficking with no, thoughtlessly, you know what I mean, that just feel very second nature and natural to, um, you know, Americans, and just stick the lesbians in there, and there's like, you know, whatever, there's a joke about the klezmatics in there, and there's some <laughs> lesbian stuff. And in principle, I feel like there's a lot of um, queer people who arrange their families in an unusual way like that, who don't, who have, at least in the past, because they didn't have 
the stricture of traditional marriage, they have been more flexible about who's allowed to come in and out of you know, a, a house, for example. So those things were sort of specifically queer about the play. But then at the same time, I was just like, I just want to I wanna write a play that will feel funny and sort of like relatively well made and yeah. comfortable yeah. for people. And you know, I think it has kind of worked. You know, it's been done in four regional theaters and the, um, there have been no uh, gay or queer actors in any of the productions, to my knowledge. Wow. Um, and, you know, although that there's been, you know, there are little bumps and whatever in it, I've had some great experiences of, like, um, there's a scene that is also taken structurally from Friends where the... <laughs> I love it. The young girlfriend and the new, and the old girlfriend and the new girlfriend bond over yeah. their shared derision of the girl, that, the woman they have in common, because she claims that she's handy around the house, and they make fun of her for not being handy around the house. So I was at one point sitting in a preview in a, in a regional theater in New Jersey, watching this scene take place, and there had been this couple, an older straight, I assumed straight c couple, watching the play, and they had been uncomfortable. You know, the guy was sitting there kind of like, you know, the whole time, like, what does this have to do with me, basically? And in the scene where the hippie girl and the ex-girlfriend bond about the, um, the girlfriend's unhandiness, I watched him go like this, like, <laughs> 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 well, like, you know, like, oh, she's really hoisted on her own petard on that one. I know what that's like. I was like, this warms my heart. You know, this guy, and by the end, he was like in it. You got through to him. Yeah, he yeah. was like, right, these people are people. They have, you know, human relationships. Well, for me, it's less about, uh, it may have started off as, as, as with a specific interest in writing gay characters or queer characters, but I slowly realized that my interest, my uh, scope of interest is wider than that, and that really what I'm drawn to, what I write about, is authenticity, is a sense of how, are, how do we be, how, how, the English language, I can use it. Um, how can we be authentic to who, who we are? How can we be truthful to who we really are? And what is that? What constructs that? Are we, mm -hmm. because so many different influences impact uh, that notion of identity. And so what does it mean to, to live an authentic life? And uh, sexuality is a big part of that. So I will oftentimes go there, but, but the main focus tends to be this concept of authenticity, which I think I share with all of uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the wonderful writers I'm up here with. Um, and because sexuality and gender are, are such uh, important cornerstones to identity, to overlook that, you don't, it's like creating a Barbie doll, you know? It's fake, it's not real. You, you want a real human being, and the human being includes all those troublesome, uh, hard to define, uh, and the more hard to define, the more interesting and the better they are, qualities of uh, identity. Yeah. yeah. I find it so problematic when there are awards that are like, we seek, you know, L award for LGBT playwriting. We want to see positive representations mm -hmm. of gay characters. And I always think, I'll never get that. Yeah. <laughs> because. Who, what is the kind of drama is that? Yeah. Really, honestly. It's just like, that's just, you can't have a play that's like good times all the time. Yeah. That's just not what, it's just not possible, well, right? Yeah that's, Who, what no. I was, yeah, that's what I was saying before about like, you just <laughs> have to have complex people in a play. Yeah. Or else it's just someone talking. It's just you a know? big party. Yeah, it's just a big like cocktail party for two hours. You know, <laughs> not that Pajama Game is a bad musical. Come on, <laughs> seven and a half. Yeah. There's also the troublemaker in me who, whenever people are saying, "Oh, we need to have positive role models and positive images," I'm like, "Yeah, but I w I'm going to give you the dirt. Yeah. I want to give you all the stuff that that's the nasty stuff <laughs> that you need. You know, as you know, the not made for for family viewing." Well, I actually don't think it helps anyone. No, it doesn't. To be like, yeah, yeah, everything's fine, la di da. It helps politically. Politically, it helps. For instance, you know, you talk, they talk about how I find it debatable, but they say, you know, will and grace paved the way to gay marriage becoming a near national thing. If that's the case, mazel tov, God bless you, great, you know. Uh, but that's where, that's where positive role model images help in the political mm -hmm. arena so that yeah. the uh, heterosexual majority can stop feeling threatened, you know, oh, they're not going to come and rape my son in high school. 
Well, I wouldn't be too sure of that. But, you know, <laughs> politically it helps put a positive spin on things so that, uh, you know, we're invited to the table. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want to talk too much. I was just going to say that just in terms of this question of negative and positive, when I, when I saw the title of this event, I was like, Oh, Beyond Angry Lesbians. Oh, that's too bad. I'm writing about an angry lesbian right now. I'm really, <laughs> I'm interested also in looking yeah. at, 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 you know, as the sort of landscape of queerness diversifies and gets more and more complex, I've been sort of nostalgic for the kinds of strident, shrill, abrasive lesbians that I grew up loving, you know, who, <laughs> <laughs> who, were, who were separatists and who yes. were, you know, difficult. And so I've written one into a, a Bakai adaptation that I'm working on now. And so, and so maybe it's, you know, there's a chance for there to be a little full circle thing in terms of those stereotypes. I mean, obviously not to deploy them unproblematically, but to think about them, to have them back so we can look at them a little. Yeah. Or you could adapt Last Summer at Bluefish Cove. Oh, Last Summer at Bluefish Cove. <laughs> By Jane Chambers. Just amazing. Tragic, yes. tragic dying lesbian. Very sad yes. what happens, yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you? Do you feel like, I mean, you've already spoken about how, kind of like having certain formal projects that yeah. drive how you work, but do you ever have projects that are related to sexuality and gender that go along as you're writing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do. Uh, there's this really fantastic essay by Jewel Gomez, um, and she talks about uh, her relationship to uh, black men. Um, particularly, like, you know, she talks about her father, but she also talks about straight black men and also other queer black men. And there's this really gorgeous passage where she talks about bumping into Essex Hemphill on the train, who was this amazing black gay poet uh, who was from D.C. And she was saying how, like, you know, our connection, the way that we talk, uh, our laughter, our spirits were in conversation with each other and it sort of transcended any kind of sexual attraction. Um, and I just thought that was such a beautiful image. And so in a lot of my most recent work, I've been looking at connection and friendship and relationship yeah. and inclusion among black people uh, that sort of transcends any sexual uh, you know, attraction or like judgment or any of those things. Um, I'm working on a play now with a commission uh, with ACT. Um, and the protagonist is this black gay man who, uh, no, he's straight actually, this black straight man who just came out of prison. He was wrongfully convicted and his case was overturned. And while he was in prison, uh, while other black men were converting to black uh, 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 Islam, he found black feminist literature. So he transformed into a black feminist while he was in prison. Uh, and so he comes out uh, after serving almost 30 years. And because he went in when he was 18, he comes out 18, uh, uh, 18, 20 years later, and he wants to have a child. He wants to be a single parent. Mm. And the only yeah. person who stayed in his life past the point of his grandmother passing was his black queer friend who was a painter mm. uh, and who was an intellectual. And she sent him a lot of black feminist literature. Uh, and they have a very deep and profound friendship uh, that they created that was all based on text, literature, and history. Uh, and so a lot of the scenes are very, very intimate. And then when you get to the scenes where she's like sexually connecting with a woman, um, you know, at least with the workshop that we had, uh, you know, it was just a really interesting conversation because everybody was like, oh, you know, the chemistry between the man and the woman is so profound. But then, you know, like the chemistry that she has with the woman is profound, too, but in different ways. Um, so I think like a lot of my work right now is just really looking at, you know, black people and intimacy. Uh, and, and there's so many different facets of it and how it doesn't have to be in competition or it's not a hierarchy at all, you know. Um, you know, it really is about just like connection and spirits and, you know, all the other mushy, hippy-dippy stuff. I was, that made me think about your play Good Goods, oh, yeah. which has like one of my favorite scenes of like all time in which uh, a woman is possessed by the spirit of a man and a man is possessed by the spirit of a woman and then yeah. they have to wrestle. They're like yeah. they have a big <laughs> knockdown blowout fight. Yeah, it's like an exorcism. Yeah, it's like it's oh my god. Yeah, when that happened, I didn't even see it coming. Like I kind of, I once that's I was like Christina Anderson, <laughs> like get out of here. Yeah. Like I couldn't believe that you made that that you made that happen. It was like, it was a really incredible like wrestling with the angel moment. But at the same time, I mean, so it that really encapsulates um, all this these questions of transcendence and spirit and being with one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, and in that play too, like I had an ingenue character who was this young girl who's 18, who's queer, and she was sort of uh, betrothed to marry this man. And she ran away during the wedding party. Uh, and uh, or, or during the engagement party, she ran away. She got on the bus and just went across town. 
uh, and uh, and she just kept going on the bus. Um, so anyway, so uh, the side story is that there's a super sexually straight, aggressive black man who she gets possessed by. And he starts catcalling her body, you know, and be like, oh, you know, these titties are great. And like, I don't know if I can say titties. Sure. Um, you know, this body is great. Oh, and this girl is so sexy, you know. And, uh, and then the person who comes in to do the exorcism uh, is this man who sort of, this very like burly man in coveralls. And he met the love of his life who was a spirit woman. Um, and when she passed away, she joined him. She joined his body so they could be one. So when she comes in, uh, so when he comes in, he comes in as her, uh, and he commits the exorcism uh, on, in the play. Um, so yeah, it was sort of like this battle of like, you know, two yeah. outwardly, you know, this very burly man and this very ingenue girl who was possessed by this burly man who was in, embodying this like female spirit. Uh, so it was like a question of, you know, performance and like gender and like love and like relationship and like all those things who happening on stage. So. And how, is that play published, or can people yeah. read it? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. awesome. So yeah. people what can find that. What about that new play you were describing? What's that called, and when when can we go see it? Uh, well, it's not done yet, but still. Um, and it's in its early stages. It's called How to Catch Creation. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone, uh, yeah, like the the uh, male protagonist in the play is having a hard time getting a kid, but everyone else in his life, through serendipitous ways, are becoming parents. Um, so that's the play. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so you guys, what, I mean, I feel like we've touched on this in certain ways, but I'm interested also in specifically zooming in on our own use of um, gay, queer representation. What is it that you feel like is, you feel called to represent? And where do you, what gaps do you feel called to fill in, in terms of American drama, like when you sit, I, when you sit down, are you like, you know, we, like you were saying, like we really need to bring back the angry lesbian. Actually, Lisa McNulty's reply to my email inviting her was like, I only want to produce plays by angry about angry lesbians. The gay best friend. She's now the artistic director of the Women's Project, but I think she was kidding. Um, but anyway, what do you feel like you guys are um, working to fill in? That's been, I mean, obviously for you. I don't, I don't know that it's a conscious working to fill in. Um, because I don't think I ever set out yeah. to, to find a niche and write about it. I think it's more, uh, along with this concept of authenticity I was talking about, uh, I, I find myself drawn to writing about characters who uh, I don't see on stage, yeah. that I'm interested in, that I don't see other people writing about, giving voice to characters who don't have voices or aren't heard. Um, this new play I'm working on right now uh, has a lesbian couple in it who are uh, right-wing Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know many, um, I ha I, at least I don't see on stage a lot of uh, LGBT uh, characters who aren't crunchy, lefty, nice. Uh, uh, you know, uh -huh. they're, they're very <laughs> right-wing and, uh, uh, and, it's, and it's completely outside of my, um, personal experience. Uh, a couple members of my family I, I draw on from time to time. But um, so it's more, I, I, it, it, there's a sense of perversity, I think, that leads me to where I write about. Uh, I always, it's, you know, for instance, you take a, any given subject, rather than attacking it head on, I will sort of walk around it and find the thing that people are trying to overlook mm -hmm. or trying to forget about uh, and that's what I will keep picking at yeah so rather than finding a particular niche and approaching it it's yeah it's it's like finding that little bit of sweater that's hanging out and pulling on that yarn and pulling on that yarn until you've realized you've taken the whole damn sweater apart that's kind of my process I suppose yeah I was so ready for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, like skip. We had an order. We had a rhythm going. And, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, um, when, when I was an uh, undergrad in college, when I was a freshman, I had the opportunity to sit in this um, workshop class with Ntozaki Shange, and she, uh, we helped her 
uh, we watched her translate her novel Lillian into a stage piece. Um, and I think I learned a lot from watching Intazaki about not necessarily focusing so much on reflecting the world that you see, or but really trying to write what's possible or what could be possible. Mm -hmm. um, and envisioning, uh, and even if that what could be or what's possible isn't idyllic, uh, there's also that freedom to say what if. Um, so I think, uh, you know, also too with a, with a lot of my pieces, I always try to include that what if possibility um, uh, as much as possible. Sometimes it's the engine of the entire play and sometimes it's just sort of a thread that lives in it. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of like a real gift that I was given to, um, mm. to stay, you know, to, to keep in mind like the realities of situations and, you know, cause I think, cause not that I think, I know that there are a lot of like queer black people who are struggling with class, class issues and like economic disparities and such. Um, and like all those things are real realities. Uh, but it's also about like, what if, you know, what are these possibilities? How can you reshape the world? Um, uh, and have a conversation in that level too. Uh, so those are things that I'm interested in presenting on stage too. Yeah. In terms of those characters, yeah, yeah, I think it's great. Any thoughts on this question? I mean, I think it's wonderful that, that these are the answers to this question, you know, that we're not just saying, uh, you know, that in a way like to approach writing LGBT characters is to kind of approach our entire humanity um, and all, our entire project as writers to really think about, um, and because ultimately I do think that's the best advice one could give is, you know, consider the entire humanity of the person. Whether you're writing an LGBT character or someone outside of your own race or class or something like that. Um, so I'm loving these answers so much. Um, did you want to say? Well, I mean, I was, I was talking to my partner before this and talking about this question of representing people who are not like oneself, you know. Uh, and she was reminding me that the, the sort of rule of thumb is that someone who is in a, uh, a, a different group from you is, is not necessarily measuring themselves against you. So if, if you're writing about somebody outside of your experience and that person keeps looking, like if you're writing about a, a gay person and they keep comparing themselves to straight people in some way in the narrative, that's how you know that you're not uh, right. addressing their full humanity. You know, right. she's like, she, I mean, she was like, you know, gay people think they're better than straight people. They're not always, but <laughs> I would say it maybe differently. Like, gay people are pursuing their own objectives. They're not like measuring against the center in that way necessarily. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a second about who's doing a great job of this these days. Like, who are our allies and um, who are we excited about? Who's doing a great job representing LGBT. I would say people on this panel. <laughs> uh, We're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, excluding myself, but yeah, I'm really excited to be here on this panel, but yeah, I think yeah. all of you are doing really excited. I'm fast, I'm, I'm, I, I have to throw Taylor Mack in the mat. Yes. In the yeah. Yeah. Um, just uh, going back to politics for a moment, one of the things that I find a little disappointing in our sort of all the political advances that, that uh, LGBT people have uh, that we've made over the last few years is that while uh, great strides have been made in terms of civil rights, uh, gay marriage, uh, the, the overwhelming movement is in this heteronormative, very conservative yeah. uh, approach that that is the image, that is the identity that, that uh, people tend to embrace. And I've never felt comfortable in that camp. Um, it's sort of, if you want to look at gays, queers, the homosexuals have won. <laughs> um, and Taylor Mack, the reason I mention him is that I think he's, he's waving that queer flag loud and proud for all of us and doing yeah. some amazing work uh, in an epic scale. Yeah. Um, and, and, really, and really reminding us th that you know, the, the, the size and the scope that the theatricality that we can mm -hmm. bring to things. So, but absolutely, this panel, I'm, I'm incredibly honored and flattered to be yeah. part yeah, of this. Yeah, you guys are badasses. Yeah. I mean, but the, actually, I mean, that makes me think about Aaron Markey, actually, who, you know, when, we st when we start going, putting the, like, ca Joe's Pub hat on for a second, you know, um, I mean, Taylor does his work all over, in all kinds of amazing venues, but Aaron Markey is a cabaret performer, um, 
who just keeps it so weird. Um, she's such an amazing, incredible genius freak, um, and incredible voice. Uh, I'm really excited to see how she develops and kind of how her project grows. There's so many great writers also. Lucy Thurber writes extraordinary plays and has, is really unafraid to kind of just like throw questions of identity in with questions, questions of class and violence and, um, and regional specificity. Yeah. I also really like Sarah Gubbins' work. Sarah's mm -hmm. a playwright out of Chicago. She's written a number of plays that may be, you could maybe term them well-made. They're really yeah. funny and sharp she's and good fighting and very, very good. Yeah. yeah, I would say uh, Daniel Alexander Jones mm -hmm. yeah. is fantastic. Uh, Sharon Bridgeforth, who I talked about earlier, she's fantastic. Um, Tracy Scott Wilson yep. is great. Uh, A. Ray Pamatmat uh -huh. is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Mashuk Dean. Oh, Dean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing writer. Yeah. I was thinking also Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, mm -hmm. um, Christine Haruna Lee, who maybe lesser known, but she has a show coming up called War Lesbian, <laughs> which is just an amazing title. Um, she's an incredible um, uh, like triple, quadruple thread singer, composer, director, maker, writer. I'm really excited to see this show. I think I'm going to totally miss it because I don't live here anymore. Uh, but if you guys could go and okay, report we'll back, go. I would appreciate it. Uh, Basil Kremendahl, yes. MJ Kauf Kaufman. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good list. What yeah. else did we write down earlier? Yeah, those are the I think I think that's pretty good. Jordan Harrison. Jordan Harrison. It's fantastic. Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, that's pretty good. I feel like we've covered kind of like we've we've moved <laughs> through time in a satisfying way that's satisfying to me anyway. Um, I'm very curious how you got how you guys are doing. It's so hot. Um, you all right. Are you with us? And what what are your questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually want to question your interpretation of positive. Um, sure. I've been writing historical plays about LGBT real life people mm -hmm. for the last 20 years and the Arch and Bruce Brown Foundation has been a major supporter. And their definition is positive. And I never took that as mm -hmm. um, fun, shallow. Uh -huh. I always took it as honest mm -hmm. and that they, their effort is to create, is to help us create a body of work that counteracts those dishonest representations mm -hmm. that came before, so that my characters have not always lived by the end of the play, uh -huh. um, you know, and they've had other issues and so on. Um, so I just wanted, like, we to sometimes I think be careful with how we define ourselves and how we we sometimes cut ourselves off because we think, oh, they mean this. I'm not going to deal with them. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think we're, we're losing out on a lot of opportunities that way. Um, one of the characters in, in my latest play is Butterfly and the Queen, who actually performed in the first play I ever wrote. Oh, uh, awesome. <coughs> and um, she That's says, cool. she explains to this other <laughs> actor that Shakespeare wrote a lot of characters for Negroes. And he said, you're, you're kidding. And she said, where does it say that Puck is Caucasian? Mm -hmm. Where does it say that this one is, you know, and she starts naming all of these characters. And he gets very upset and he says, well, what about the kings and queens of England? And she just you know, walks off. So, you know, we have to, we, I think we'll often watch our own interpretation. That's mm -hmm. good. I mean, I think that's a useful distinction. Positive reading, honest versus positive reading, like boosterish or somehow yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. be like up with people. Yeah. That is significant. Well, it's just yeah. a matter of not, of not, Both the positive and negative, where where one's gender or, sec or sexuality or sexual identity is either a virtue or a vice, mm -hmm. that that in and of itself is what defines mm -hmm. the virtue or vice of the character. Mm -hmm. So those plays that say, "Oh, they're wonderful because they're gay," which there's all those after-school TV specials from uh, when would it be like the early '90s or something that that sort of says, you know, there are people too. Um, as a, which is pushed back against a lot of plays from, I guess, from the 20s through the 60s, which is, they're gay, they must die, because they're evil. So, so I think that's a differentiation, is that uh, you know, the story, the plot, or, or the character can, can run the gamut as long as, because the gender has no, 
we as a society are, who are imprinting the values on, on the gender, the gender itself has no moral value in and of itself. I think that's a differentiation between a, a positive and a mm. uh, realistic or an or a, or a artistic approach to it. Great. Any other, other questions or discussion points? Yeah. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, I was, I was uh, referred by a classmate of mine who read the book to come because I'm writing a play that is set in a queer activist house, and it's about how someone in the house who's trans goes missing. Um, and it's based on someone that I know, because I, I have this personal experience. And um, there was a question when my pages were read about, because this this person uses the pronouns her and the, which I don't know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And there was a question of using um, she to help the audience in my stage directions. And I've been trying to figure out how to, I, no. I, I see this person, right? And I, <laughs> I'm just curious as to how, I'm still trying to figure out how to be generous in explaining to my peers this is not a she situation. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts when you've like faced uh, Oh, <laughs> moments where we've faced having to, um, issues of translation. Yeah. And yeah. how do you stick to your guns and or, you know, move the conversation forward in a room full of people who haven't had that conversation before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like that happens a lot in terms of casting. Uh, yeah. um, but do you guys wanna, what, um, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, I have a play that's set during the Great Depression and um, uh, the city is segregated. There's a black neighborhood and there's a character in the play who is a white woman, trans woman, um, who's living in a black neighborhood. Uh, and, uh, you know, she used the pronoun she, like I, I labeled or I in, um, created her based off of Rosalind Russell uh, and Cher from Moonstruck. Um, <laughs> She sort of like floats through the play like that. Uh, and casting is a nightmare for this play uh, because I often get people who say, uh, well, we have this fabulous actor who's a fabulous drag queen and he can come in and perform. Um, you know, uh, I've always just wanted a, a trans person <laughs> to play the part. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I've had it both ways. I've had, um, you know, a man play the part and I've had a, 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 a biological, you know, female male. Um, I've had it both ways. And when it's someone who people can identify as male, uh, that character is laughed at mm. a lot more, mm -hmm. is what I noticed. Um, uh, there's a lot more humor in it. Uh, at the end of the play, she falls in love with this guy. Um, and uh, uh, the, a, a lot of the audience questions are like, well, when he finds out, he's going to hurt her, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, is, or is he gay, you know? Uh, but then when it's someone who people identify as female, it's just like, oh, that was such a great story. It was so interesting. You know, I felt like she was black. Like, all of a sudden, she becomes black, <laughs> even though she's, like, white. So it's oh been, like, God. so, you know, I was sort of wrestling about, like, you know, when I'm not in the room, like, how are these conversations going to happen with, yeah. like, casting? Oh, yeah. Uh, so the author's note, you know, initially was two pages long, <laughs> you, you know, and it was just like, hey, you know, if you want to read this material, if you want to look at this historical context, um, and I, I, I mean, I don't know how you all have handled these things, but I still haven't found a way to, I mean, <coughs> like hopefully people will Google and like watch this archive and hear me talking about it, but um, it's a really tricky thing to have to figure out how to educate an audience, but also um, just have your play live, yeah. you know? I think if you just lead terms. the way, if you just, rather than trying to reach and educate, just mm -hmm. lead the way with your voice yeah. and, Hopefully, uh, my experience has been in seeing other writers do do things like that. Is that people hear you and they follow? Right. Yeah. So rather than reaching back and, and trying to educate and how do I communicate back? No. If you if you're forceful enough and you're honest enough and you're truthful in what you're telling, mm -hmm. people will hear that truth and follow you. But there's no. I mean, I'm sure you're gonna you can speak more specifically to this question of language. But like, I mean, you. You should never write anything to help someone in your play, right? I mean, yeah, there's I no there's no reason to have help in a piece of art. And I'm telling you that right, I, right, I was, right. I was so I was kind of taken aback by it. 
But that's just another way of saying what no, you absolutely, just said. No, absolutely, absolutely. The yeah. Mona Lisa don't have the training wheels. wheels. Right. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, it's like, and then the question of how to, how to constrain future productions after you've left is a totally separate, uh, terrifying question that I yeah. handle through copious amounts of denial. So I don't know how <laughs> to. I struggle with, I struggle, f I've struggled for years with how to, s how to identify the gender of the character because for many years I didn't, actually I think I tried to write that someone was butch or that it was a, before that they were trans to me, I would be like this is, this role is to be played by, like this male role is to be played by a woman. And my classmates would be like what, why? You know, why say that? Like, it's hard to understand that. And so then at one point someone counseled me to write, at this play's premiere, all of these roles were played by, or these male mm -hmm. roles were played by women. Uh -huh. And I was like, all right, that's okay, but that's like me not necessarily naming it or owning it, you know? Uh, and as time has gone on, I've, I've tried different things, but mm -hmm. I still don't feel settled, but partly it's because I still, I'm very worried. Like, if Becca Blackwell is booked on another job, what am I gonna do? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know one other trans masculine actor who's the right age for, or I know one or two other people. So it actually scares me <laughs> about the longevity of the work. I mean, actually, luckily, there are generations coming up that are much bigger um, who identify as trans and gender queer, gender nonconforming, who are gonna be able to take that up, but they, you know, they're, they're coming up. They're not there yet, so that worries me. What you're talking about there is breaking down the barriers and teaching audiences and even actors what you need to do, which is an interesting problem. But a little, a little while ago, you brought up for the first time really this drag idea and audiences being more accepting uh -huh. if they can see the underlying absolute mm -hmm. gender mm -hmm. distinction mm -hmm. and yeah. then uh, deal with it that way. I was wondering, I think I'm having trouble getting theater companies seeing my plays because they don't use that model of it's got to be a man underneath pretending to be a woman or a woman underneath pretending to be a man. And they, right. they don't like the idea that it's not, that you're all nodding. I was gonna ask, how do you get through that barrier? <laughs> how do you get uh, the artistic tell me. directors uh, no, you tell I don't me. understand okay. and, and accept what you're doing? I think uh, we're in that's the- That's the answer I got, yeah. Yeah. We're in the process of trying to knock loudly on the door. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I struggle with this all the time, and I don't know. I don't. I, I've been underwhelmed <laughs> with the, you know, people's. W I mean, but, I, but there have been people who have, who have been supportive of my work and have been like, all right, let's just do this. But partly it's because I'm like, yeah, and let's call Becca, you know, because I have this person who m is starting to be widely acknowledged as like, you know, awesome. And so I know in some ways it, it's a little bit of like maybe if there is an ideal performer that you can do a reading with that person to kind of show people what you mean, and as you begin to show people what you mean, then it kind of enters the vocabulary a little bit more. It's a, it's a voice that has not been represented on yeah. stage. Uh, and to start, start giving voice to those characters is difficult. It is knocking on that, it's knocking that door down. It's, it's yeah. uh, um, I mean, Becca, uh, read a role of it's it's not a transgender role, it's uh, it's a role in this new play that I'm right, been working on of a very stereotypically masculine lesbian. Uh -huh. There's just not. I mean, I, I looked around like, where are the actors to to yeah. play this role? And I was lucky enough to meet Becca, who who is incredible. This is going to be the Becca panel. <laughs> uh, I know I have to tell them to watch the thing. But, but the bottom line is that the, because these voices have not been represented, that's why a lot of these theaters, it's like going to them and saying, "I want to write a play in Pig Latin." Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's just it's outside the scope in the same way that a couple decades ago, going and saying, "I want to write a gay character." who's not a drag queen and does not commit suicide and is not evil, and they'll say, well, what's his or purpose? Or is the protagonist. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, that, that very notion. Uh, and that's why I said earlier that this is really, the, these are the front lines of the battle, because these are voices that have not been represented before and that yeah. need to be. Yeah, but working on it. I mean, we've been through, Madeline and I have a long history of talking about um, the casting of butch characters mm -hmm. in a v variety of um, different, uh, grassroots groups that have been tr trying to work that out 
and there is a kind of underground <laughs> network, which casting yeah, network. There is an underground network. That's but true. but it's still we it still it have to, you know, uh, like scrape around every time we have the conversation. Well, there was you know my partner is Lisa Crone, who wrote the book and lyrics for Fun Home, the musical, and um, you know that musical. <laughs> Like it's sort of it's insane, but there was an article that came out in a major publication when that musical was having its premiere off Broadway last season. The headline of the article is was Is America ready for a butch lesbian protagonist? Oh God. wow, you know, that is like still that's the question. Now my hope is once that thing opens on Broadway, no longer will that headline run. Maybe it'll still be people will still sort of feel panicked around these questions, but at least it will have happened because I guess up until now, with the exception of what's her name who runs around West Side Story, there's not really been a oh, butch yeah. lesbian. Remember she's so, yeah. so sweet. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't have a song or anything. No. Um, <laughs> she does a lot of kick and gravel. There's like a there's like <laughs> a phys ed teacher in Hairspray or something I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Oh, there's uh, uh, Sister George. Well, oh Sister Lord. George. Mm, well, but yeah. camp is a separate. I mean, uh, like this is a separate true. question in a way from what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, also too, uh, you know, I've I've had these kind of parts where you know I have, uh, I'm assuming straight uh, black women play the part, and if this comes up to be butch or anything, like their definition of masculinity is actually like quite narrow too, mm -hmm. um, or like how to perform it or what to tap into. Um, you know, all of a sudden, it's just about like you know why it's taking up as much space as possible and like you know slamming fists on the chest and stuff too. Uh, and I think it's actually more complicated than that. You know, I mean, I know a lot of fantastic men. You know, I mean, I know David. Uh, yeah, I have cousins. You know, I mean, who just like who who just like you know, I mean, the spectrum is really broad too. Just in the same way that like you know, women like the spectrum is broad as well. So, you know, sometimes I come up against you know, people even stereotyping, you know, masculinity or what a man does or what a woman does or how they walk or how they look. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, even that's a frustration too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really think representation is everybody's business. Um, I've started to get on students lately about, um, like, are you gonna, are you gonna write that play where the man kills the woman? Yeah. Are you? Like, I mean, I've never really questioned that kind of thing before, but lately I'm like, I can't anymore. I can't sit by while you write a play where a man kills a woman. Like, let's talk about that. Um, is that the only option here? You know, what, like getting deeper into those characters and things like that. Um, really asking everybody to think about, um, I mean, I think, I think that these questions really ask everyone to think about their own res their responsibilities to representing anyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, are we giving everyone full access to humanity? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we have a Twitter question. Yes. Um, I'm writing a play about two uh, straight acting gay dads who have a surrogate and have this son who's married who's a championship wrestling champ, he's a wrestler, and he's very fat. He's this big guy, he's very fat. So I'm, I'm kind of examining all this and, and putting it on their head. And, you know, but my thing in writing is like, I have, I have, there have to be straight acting masculine and gay men, just to make my point. Yeah. And this kid has to be an overly effeminate big guy wrestler to make my, to, to, to kind of go on the spectrum of what I'm, you know, and yeah. it's, it's uncomfortable because I have to, I mean, I write in the dialogue, but these are traits that are, this is, I'm examining these traits, not the, not, not the gender, but the traits. Yeah. So it's like, you, you know, going with this, it's like, I need to make sure, I mean, I, I, here I'm being director. But I, I would like for this to, to sort of be the, the way it's presented. How do you make sure you get what you want? Yeah. Is that the question? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. I mean, I think one, my first thought was like when you were saying um, the thing about you're like you're trying to embed it into the dialogue. Right. I think I find that you know play texts are way more contractual than we think when we're writing them. You know, I've had if, arguments with people where it's like. But it's not in the text, you know, such and such, whatever the question was. And I'm like, but I'm telling you. And they're like, mm mm, you can't just tell me just because you're the playwright. Like, put it in the play. And I, you know, they, I can't make that argument that just because I say it, that it's. So if, if there's, if it cannot be disputed because of the language that you're using, you know, actors go through plays and look for everything that the character says about themselves and that the other people say about them. So if you have that going, like th there's, I don't know, maybe people in the audience can speak to this, but um, 
yeah, like part of what their job is is to kind of mine the scripts for those clues. And if those clues are there, then no one can argue with you. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that, well, I mean, the but things can be ignored. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I have a, I, I have had the experience of having, let's say, a seduction scene between two women that's written for there to be some butch femme dynamic of some kind in the scene. To yeah. me, it's perfectly obvious. In yes. fact, incomprehensible without it. And then you yes. see two people who it's not their fault, but they don't, they don't tap into that dynamic, yeah. and they read it, and the scene is like absurdism. You know, it's like you, you mm -hmm. it's, there's, and there's no there there. You yeah. like, I can't see the scene. Where's the scene? Um, and it, it's because the, it's you know they don't they yeah. don't know what the they don't know what the objectives are, the objectives which seem so clear to me in the language, yes, um, are not clear. So I don't. I'm that's not that's not helpful. That's just complaining. But sometimes no, <laughs> I've had well, that's, that that's helpful. <laughs> I've had that exact experience, and, and sometimes I wonder. I'm like, well, can I say that they haven't done their jobs fully? I don't yeah, know. I don't know. But I don't want to. You know. But it's like, but yeah. To what degree? It's the same thing of like, how, where do I have to give you help? Like well, this is so, because I just said that thing about help and art, and, uh, but I actually wrote, I realized that in the play that I'm working on now that has the shrill strident lesbian in it, I wrote, I wrote this little, like a kind of like a mash note to the imaginary actor who I imagine doing the thing. Let's say Becca's not available, mm -hmm. and also she's too young for the part. So let's say some actor is going to encounter this who doesn't naturally come to this naturally. And I just wanted to be like, imagine that this happened to you when you were young. Imagine you felt like this when you were eight. Imagine you felt like this when you were 12. Imagine when you walk, you feel like you move from your shoulders, not from your hips. You know, imagine you are, you, you're, uh -huh. you think of yourself more like a dragon than like a bear. You know, like what, just like what ways could I talk to a person who I may never meet about what kind of like chi would move through her as this former lesbian separatist turned landscape gardener. Do you know what I mean? Like where, where <laughs> might she have found herself in the world? You know, how does she, you know, how does she feel about killing a bug? Like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that's like some of those <laughs> cheesy exercises, like, you know, 12 things about your character or something. But I didn't mean it that way. I wrote it as a letter, like, dear person that I may never meet. And I did it as a free write. And then I was like, you know what? I'm putting this, this at the back of the script when I send it out. Because mm. I just feel like maybe there'll be some you know, some piece of sort of like lyric or something in there that will get, because you just say, you know, butch or even straight acting or, you know what I mean? Like you can really trigger people because they feel like they're, they have to make sure they don't whatever, either from the left or from the right, they feel like they have to make sure they don't fall into some trope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. It's endless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the Twitter question was, did any of us see The Nance with Nathan Lane? Oh, I didn't see it. I, I didn't see it. it. Yes. Oh. Is there, I, that was the end of the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything that has bearing on this conversation from that show? I'm sure there is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have, yeah, no more on this okay. topic. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, so you just mentioned Fun Home, and I've really been enjoying this conversation. I'm a uh, musical, and I'm working on a very gay theme. And so I was just wondering if you guys had any thoughts on musicals, just because I know you're all, <laughs> I was about to say straight playwrights, but that's not <laughs> the right term, but you're, you're playwrights. So, um, you know, I don't know, one thing I've been learning about musicals is just the dramaturgy, character, all of that is so different from plays without music. So I was just wondering. Well, I have been working on, um, I have worked a little bit with music, and I've been working on this musical, and, uh, writing the book for this musical for a number of years now. Uh, with uh, Harry Connick Jr. running the music. And uh, it's set in uh, wow. right after the stock market crash of 1929 mm -hmm. in Manhattan. And in it, uh, there are these two characters uh, who are both sort of schemers. Uh, and uh, one is a closeted lesbian, and one is a closeted gay man. And they think that in order to achieve their goal, they need to fall in love with each other, <laughs> which leads to disastrous <laughs> results. Um, that wasn't the answer to your question, though, was it? Well, is, this, is this a comedy? Like what you're yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Is the question yeah. like, what's the difference? Of, is there a difference between representing gay characters in uh, uh, straight plays versus musicals? Yeah, that's what it, like all the different themes you've been talking about. Like, I'm not familiar with a lot of the writers. That, well, almost any of the writers you're, you're mentioning, but the themes make a lot of sense and are stuff I'm really interested in. So I'm just wondering, yeah, exactly what you just said. How this I don't know, one, one thing that pops to mind, and I don't, I, I, in a way I wonder if in a musical you have to work harder 
to avoid um, convention because you're just maybe more heavily in dialogue with convention yeah. at, while you're trying to make the book work. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, that might be vague and I don't know. What are the gay musicals that you like? I'm sorry. Um, well, Hedwig. Hedwig? Yeah. You see, the wonderful thing, the difference between Hedwig or uh, a lot of sort of the, 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 the conventional musicals rely so much more on type. Right. Uh, a musical like Hedwig or, which I think is a lot more, is a lot closer to a play with music than a musical. Please don't argue, you know, I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> with any, right. but, but because it's a lot more, it, the, 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 it goes so much deeper into character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, so many musicals uh, rely on stock types to get the narrative moving forward. So there isn't that much time, uh, you don't have that much time to set characters up so you can get the, the mechanism of the story going, which th will then release the music and create the musical. Uh, whereas Hedwig or, or plays, which you have a lot more time, to get into and explore and indulge in character, the complexity, the, the contradictions, the nuances. Um, it's tricky then to be able to do that and balance the music, uh, ha find those moments where it releases the music. So you haven't gone so far into character that you have to then come back to be able to deliver the music. That's the tricky balance, I'd imagine. Yeah. Do you know Do you know Todd Allman's musical Girlfriend? No. That's that's it's a d it's a dream. It's a fantastic, but very unusual in terms of its book and structure and musical. Right. I don't know if you could get your hands on it because I don't know that it's been recorded, but it's that's Where something that's worth looking up. At they Berkeley. At, at, it was at Berkeley Rep, mm. and then they did a concert of it at Joe's Pub, which I happened to see. Mm. It's just it's just fine. fantastic. Yeah, it's a scene. Let's take this question back here. I have a question about the use of queer and what that Great. means in contemporary Great. days because I will even see LGBTQ. So Q is you know, something different than the G. And uh, I wonder, I'm asking this also in a larger sense, how politically, ideologically tolerant is theater within this um, well, sexual identity community, or the, the sexual gay community. Is there something, you know, how politically or ideologically tolerant and diverse can this be? Because, uh, David, you are writing a play I was interested about conservative gay women, and they exist because they're my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so are they I know the that. bad guys? <laughs> are they the bad guys? I mean, you know, can we can we write with passion with passion and understanding and I mean not in, I'm not saying that in a condescending way. Can we under, can we understand political diversity? Can I write a pro Zionist piece today and have that presented? Or is that going to be shouted down? So I'm saying how how ideologically diverse and tolerant is, is this community today. That and what, and that gives me back to what is queer. Right. That yeah. question, that question, and the repetition of that question, I think, is our duty, is all of our duties, uh, to constantly ask, are we living up to our ideals? Are we actually living up to the things that we believe in? Or are we just finding another safe camp to live in and say, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. I think that's absolutely necessary, what you were saying before about finding the humanity in, in, in the characters. That's first and foremost, I think, I don't want to speak for others, but I, at least for me, that's first and foremost my goal is to stick up for the humanity of these characters, of all the characters that I write. Um, and to constantly ask that question, to challenge the assumptions, you know, this, I'm not supposed to say this these days, and to say it. And to find out, oh yeah, why shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Were you asking to def us to define queer? Yeah, could you do that? Because you, know, you you're open to the panel discussion with, with gender. Yeah. I mean, how do I, how, yeah. how do we wish to be called by gender? 
And I think you're perfectly right in doing so. So what is correct for you to maintain? Because I come from a generation that didn't get that somewhere with the majority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I think that's exactly what I was going to, that, that was going to be my answer, which is I think that it's, um, there's a generational shift away from the words lesbian and gay and into, uh, I don't even know where it begins exactly, but it started to be that people were reclaiming this word because it allowed there to be um, more multiplicity and it also, with, within the description of, of themselves, and it also was able to incorporate both sexuality and gender. Somehow, like lesbian and gay alone didn't encompass the, the complicated mix that some individuals were feeling themselves to be. I know that when I was coming up, I was definitely like, lesbian, hmm, I'm, I don't know, you know? And partly it was because I felt, I actually felt like it, ha it was a historical term that applied to, s I mean, I don't think I knew enough to say this, I say it now, but I certainly felt uncomfortable with it for many reasons, both historically in terms of my generation and because of my burgeoning gender identity issue that I was discovering but didn't know how to name. So I was like, I don't know why this doesn't feel right, but it also doesn't feel right to hang with the women in my family or go to the women's room and be kind of tossed out of it. Like, uh, there's, so there's like so many ways that, so I think that queer started to evolve as people became more articulate and more accepting actually, less internally transphobic about um, the nuances of their gender expression. So they needed a word that could encompass all of those things. That's my thought. There's also a political, there's also a political aspect to it in that uh, with, with the whole, I mean the way I define it personally, and this is just me, no one else, I'm sure there's other people who might agree with me, that uh, I define it as um, uh, gays and lesbians or homosexuals who want to say to the world that they are just like heterosexuals <laughs> in all but who they uh, sleep with. Queer people, such as myself, aren't actually interested in being just like straight people. I'd rather find out who I really am and live that authentic life. And that mean, if that means uh, a polyamorous relationship, so be it. If that means marriage, so be it. If that means uh, just having fun, so be it. But that it's that it's uh, about it's about finding the truth in your identity a lot more, and that that's a lot harder to pin down in a political arena. Uh, and a lot harder to represent in a political arena because it doesn't fit into these strict categories of what your what your objectives are, what your political or sociological objectives are. Yeah. I think this is great. Um, we've had awesome questions. We've covered a lot of territory. Is there any any last thing that people are wanting to raise? Yeah. Well, I just want to talk about anger. I don't want to get too far away from the anger button because I think being gay is still a political act. We're in this little bubble of tolerance right now, but do not fool yourself if you pose like that. So we're getting our work done, yes, but sometimes, like your beautiful letter about the character, you have to, when you're in rehearsal, even in New York City with tolerant people, you have to fight, fight, fight yeah. to s get the things you want to see on stage with smart actors, good directors, your beautiful note of directors say, no, I'm sorry, it's a scratch. So you still have to be prepared to fight every second as a gay person, even in New York City in 2014. Just let's not forget that. Yeah, that's I true. think that's true, and there is a lot of work to be done, just in terms of knocking on the door um, and raising these conversations from casting to, um, I don't know, what gets put on stage. Uh, yeah. So thank you guys for your thank you all thank for you thoughts and words, and thank you all for your attention. And, um, and your feedback and engaging with this conversation. Cool. Thank you. Thanks.